of tonight's presentation. It's the second in the Keene State College Faculty Student Scholarship Seminar of this academic year, 2021-22. Uh, if you're in person, consider this just a normal talk. Uh, uh, raise your hand, ask questions. Uh, the mics will pick you up so the people at home can hear your questions. Uh, and it's just, you know, the same sequence. If you're here via Zoom, a couple of special rules we want to have in place. Uh, one is that we'd like you to turn your microphones off and turn your cameras off, uh, or at least not be offended if we go in and do that to you. This will allow us to focus on the speaker and their slides and pull the other people off the camera. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please use the chat function. And one of us who are hosts will relay that question to the presenters when they are done. Uh, before we get started tonight, a little bit more uh, bookkeeping next week. We will not be meeting here in this, uh, in this room. We'll be meeting online. And the talk that I'd like you to see is one that's been postered around campus and advertised online uh, a bit for the past couple of weeks. It's the Got Rights Lecture for Constitution Day, the Store Lecture, uh, with uh, Professor Leah, Mur Leah Murray, PhD from uh, Weber State. She's going to be talking about the Bill of Rights. Uh, it is something we do every year a discussion about the Constitution. Um, and that talk is going to be on Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, the link for that talk is on the poster, which is also linked to your Canvas site. Go there, get on the link, uh, see you next week. It will be recorded. If you can't be there Tuesday, because that's the day you have another class, you can look at the recorded version of the talk if you want to make that one of your, one of your, just one of your classes for this semester. Okay. So tonight's speaker uh, is actually three speakers. Uh, we are looking at a professor and two student researchers. The, the professor is Dr. Melanie Adams, uh, from, who's an associate professor from the program of Human Performance and Movement Science. Uh, Dr. Adams is actually a Keene State graduate. We have quite a few of those teaching here and she's, she's one of our best. Uh, she has a BS in physical education from Keene State. She went on to get her master's degree uh, at the University of Virginia and a PhD in kinesiology and exercise psychology at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Adams has been teaching at Keene State since 2012 for nine years now. Uh, her classes are Intro to Exercise uh, Science, Exercise Psychology, which I think is a really interesting class, uh, and Research Methods for Research Areas Center on uh, um, Reduction of Sedentary Behavior. Uh, the relationship between physical activity and psychological and physical well-being and exercise among populations like overweight or older adults. Uh, she's one of Key State's most active researchers. She's got a long line of presentations and publications to her name. She stands out as a leader of faculty mentored student research, which is part of why she's here tonight uh, with two of her star students, Liz Windsor and Sophie Hatch. Um, I will let Dr. Adams introduce them and talk about the research that inspires their presence here tonight. Their talk is going to be undoing the gender binary in fitness. So please welcome Dr. Milling. Wow, that was certainly one of the longest introductions I've ever got. Woo, I feel kind of good about myself right now. So Sophie and Liz were kind enough to give me about 15 minutes to explain to you what we did and sort of uh, my job here is to help you understand the layers of culture that have accumulated to the point that we have gendered fitness. And so I'm going to explain all these terms that I'm using. And I want you to try to think about, like, what if everything wasn't exactly the way that you were used to it being? Like, does it exactly have to be this way? And why is it the way that we do things? So maybe that'll make itself a little more clear as we move in. But this is really about like, ask yourself why a lot when you're talking about gender and our culture, sports and fitness. So the word I want to key in on first is gender binary. The gender binary is the concept or belief that gender is solely judged and based on someone's physical, uh, pre the physical presence of their sexual organ. So males have a penis, females do not, and that is all there is. These are two boxes, there's nothing in between. And so that the biology is the dictator of gender. 
The gender binary is these two ideas with nothing in between. And we see that as being pretty evident in sport and fitness. Sport particularly, we have gendered teams. We have the same sport, soccer, basketball, with two completely different teams based on gender. Right? So you can see that's, that's clearly there. And we have accepted this for quite a long time. Um, the cultural part that you have to start thinking about and layering on top of this notion of gender binary is it's not just somebody's physical self that makes them male or female. It's also what does society say constitutes being female or being male? What are the characteristics, the attitudes, mannerisms, even the dress of males and females? And why do we accept that as being just the way it is? So as you layer this cultural piece on top of the binary, you start to see how we replicate binary over and over in sport and fitness to the point so much now that we actually have terminology within fitness that is very gendered. I'm gonna let my students talk about where we see that gendered language come out. I have these two pictures um, of physical education, a very typical physical education class programming in the 1960s. This is from the same high school in California. And you can see very clearly, we have separated the sexes and that the male activities are dominated by strength and the female activities are dominated by aesthetic. Um, how they look is much more important than what they can do. And this is layered on, you know, centuries of gendered norms. What was it that meant be a female? What was it that meant to be a male? And males were privileged with the opportunity to play sports, to be more physically active than females. And so our, our society has adopted that as boys are more active, girls are less active, the activities that boys want to play are rough and tumble, they're muscle building, the activities that girls are interested in are prettier, softer, and usually um, revolve around aerobics, right? So as we moved into um, the middle of the 19th century or so, there were more sociologists looking at sport and the divisions between sport, and they developed sort of a framework called the fair play ideal. So in order to create fair play, it was sort of a rationale for why there was the gender separation. It's about fair play. Under the fair play ideal, all males would be stronger than any female. That's the assumption that underlies fair play. So in that assumption, there is no room for a female to be able to play as well or be as strong or um, succeed in the same ways that the male athletes or male students were allowed to. And so that was the beginning sort of of this incredible separation. We saw it in sport, we saw it in physical education, and it continues into fitness. Um, so much so that it, it's almost underlying everything that I do. I teach a class called um, Testing and Programming of Fitness. And it wasn't until I started working with clients who were transgendered that I actually go, wait a minute, they don't fit on any of these charts. They don't fit into any of these schemes. What does that mean? So what I'm talking about, how many people remember in high school taking some sort of fitness test? Maybe it was the mile run, it was you know climbing something, right? So based on the gender that you presented as, you had a chart. And your physical education teacher looked at that chart and said, you're average, you're above average, you're below average based off of what you were able to produce for your gender. So all of our fitness tests require gender. I had never actually thought about that before I started working with somebody who actually says, uh, no, I don't have a single gender. My gender is somewhere in between these or I am moving my gender from an assumption of this to more what I feel like. And I had to stop pretty much everything that I had associated with professionally and go, how am I gonna work like this? Like this person is due physical activity just as much as anybody else. How do I work with that? So that started me down this road of really questioning how we deal with culture 
and the, gen the gender binary in fitness. <clears throat> fitness is very gender. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot to go and find examples of fitness being gendered. How many people are uh, basketball fans? March Madness just passed six, week, six months ago, right? So that's my bottom picture right there. The male athletes had awesome <laughs> weight rooms, unbelievable weight rooms, every kind of apparatus you can imagine, and square footage galore. Right? I don't know how much working out anybody was supposed to do with two days between basketball games. As a, as a strength coach, I'm going, how much are we actually lifting? Why are we doing this? But clearly, there's a huge gender divide. And you can say, OK, the NCAA really screwed up. The NCAA is an institution that has institutionalized gender. And they did it, and they showed how clearly they think, what they clearly think women do in terms of resistance training. So the women teams in their locker room got this pyramid of six sets of dumbbells, um, all of which I think that the highest one is 15 pounds. Liz says that's like her warm up. So what are we doing, right? It's no longer the gendered physical education classes that I showed. This is 2021 and it's still there. So it's clear that we have a fitness uh, problem. We have a problem in fitness with the gender binary. It clearly reinforces our gender stereotypes, that males are bigger, faster, stronger, and that any male is going to be all females. That goes back to the fair play ideal. That is why there's the separation that's been uh, determined. There's actually kind of a fun term for how the genders separate themselves in facilities. So a number of different uh, scholars have uh, watch. They do sociology type research where they go to fitness centers and they watch where do people go? What do people do? The cardio resistance divide is really a thing. Males propagate the uh, weight room areas and they are allowed to go do cardio, but women propagate the cardio areas and do very little moving towards the weight room. There's a social barrier that has been created. There is a what is cool, what is okay, what is normal, and people abide by it. If you actually have a female that moves over into the weight room, they are partaking in what's called transgression, sociology transgression. They are making a very bold statement. And my students will talk about some of the research that we did when we actually talked to women who transgress in this way, what they feel, what they experience. So who's allowed to do what activities is very privileged. Even here at Keene State, we have two very separated gendered areas in our fitness center. The bottom floor where the larger weight equipment is, is what's called the weight room. That is technically the weight room. There is a smaller area up on the third floor that now has more weights. Every year, there seems to be another thing that's put into this area. And I've heard people call this the women's weight room. I'm getting a lot of knots because I think you've probably heard it too. And so what we're seeing is females are interested in resistance training. They're uncomfortable with whatever's happening in the lower weight room. And they're moving into this much smaller space with less equipment and equipment that is incredibly old and equipment that's mismatched on a floor that's not meant to have dumbbells dropped on it. Right? So it's an inadequate space. Separate is never equal. So where we went and what I was interested in because of my experience working with the trans clients was this idea of the binary fitness test, that all of our tests are gendered in this way. And I wanted to see, is there a way that we could start knocking this down? Could we start untangling gender from a fitness test? Uh, some other better scholars than me have worked out what they call the fallacy of fair play. So they've uh, written a rebuttal to that fair play ideal. The fair play ideal disregards those following things, that gender is actually across a biological spectrum, that it is not so singularly boy, girl, that there is a range of hormones in all of us and a range of abilities to use those hormones, and that X and Y chromosomes are not as clear cut as we once thought they were. So the biology is actually changing and shifting to say that humans, like 
most other uh, beings that we have studied actually present a spectrum of their gender, not just boy, not just girl. We also see that boys have had this privilege for such a long time. They have the social advantage of early training, early access to physical activity, and just basically the expectation that because they are a boy or a male child, that they're gonna be physically active, that they're gonna partake in sports and wanna be strong and big and do things. So if you're thinking sort of reflecting, how did you get into sport and fitness? What were the things that you did? It was probably, if you're a male, it was probably culturally accepted for you to do that. If you're female, you might recognize, gee, I, I kind of had some battles. I kind of had to push against some of the norms in order to have that access. Fair play also disregards that women can train hard enough and long enough to actually meet and exceed male standards of fitness. So that there is ability of this overlap. And if we just separate genders, we're saying that there's no, there's no overlap at all, that it doesn't matter how hard a female works, they're not ever going to do 30 uh, standard push-ups, for example, which would hit our criteria of excellence. So the push-up in my mind is sort of the classic binary fitness test because it's gendered twice. It's sort of like double gender. It's gendered in the positioning. And you can see in my pictures, these individuals, the top one is the standard push-up and the bottom one is what's called the modified push-up. So we gender the protocol, the positioning of the person, and then the grading scales for the push-up also include the, here's the column for boys, and here's the column for girls. Right away, we recognized that there were two populations that this test does not work for. The first was females who could already do a standard push-up. Why would we ask them to go backwards? And yet we do, the ACSM guidelines, the organization that oversees fitness in the U.S. says that if women over the age of 18 want to be graded on a normative scale so that they get that average above average rating, they have to show how many reps they can do in the modified. There is no scale for standard push-up for females, even if females can do the standard push-up. So we thought that was just wrong and that we wanted to fix that. The second population as I mentioned before, the transgender or non-binary individual. Having to pick from two things that don't actually match who you are is a very difficult thing to do if you're in a fitness testing situation. And those numbers uh, on the chart really didn't relate to who that person was. So those were the two people we had in mind when we started our work um, last spring. So our first solution was to create a study where we could come up with another rating scale where women could do a standard push-up and be scored for it in that average, above average, excellent type way that we're sort of used to. What we're going to be working towards is creating a non-binary push-up. And I'm going to let my students explain how, what we did and how we're going to get to where we're going. So Sophie is going first. All right. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about our first step of the push-up study, creating that scale for a woman to be able to do a standard push-up. Before I get into the nitty-gritty details about what we did, I wanna talk a little bit about the genderized language around the push-up and really prove our point of why we chose the push-up in the first place. So how many of you have heard the term girl push-up? I know I definitely have. And when you hear that term, <coughs> you automatically know that it refers to a push-up from the knees, from the modified position. And that, that push-up from the toes is the standard position. And it's often thought that men perform that form of push-up. There are women that can do a standard push-up. And that on the other end of the spectrum, there are men who can't perform a standard push-up. So why do we assume that women have to do a modified push-up to get a, a rating? Why does the ACSM make women do the modified push-up in order to get their rating? So these are some of the exact questions that we've been wondering about, and we've wanted to sort of try to answer and fix these problems. We wanted to create a more equal and less gendered fitness scale. So as our first step, we conducted a quantitative study over the last semester with 73 cisgender KSC female students, ages 18 to 24, 
And we recruited them passively through sending out emails and actively we you might have seen us setting up a table in the student center and in the dining commons trying to recruit female participants to come and join our study. So once we got enough recruits, we started following through. Participants came in for two sessions. The first session, they filled out a health history questionnaire, which allowed us to make sure there was no health concerns for them while performing these push-ups, that they were going to be able to do them safely. Once we got that out of the way, we would do a nice little warm-up. It includes some walking, some resistance band movements, and then some body weight movements as well to make sure the muscles were warm and that these clients were safely performing the push-ups. Our next step was to do a coin flip. We flipped a coin and decided, and the coin decided whether the participant was gonna do standard push-ups or modified push-ups on their first day. This allowed for no personal preference to um, sort of mess with our data at all. So once that coin was decided, say they got standard push-ups, they would perform their standard push-ups. We had um, some specific details to make sure that the push-up was correct. We wanted to see a full 90 degree bend in the elbow and then a full extend. We didn't want to see any, any bending or bowing in the abdomen. And we really kept a good eye on to make sure these push-ups were being performed with correct position. If we noticed that our client was sort of um, not going to the full 90 degrees or their hips were sagging down, we would give them one warning and then on their second warning, they would be done. Because if you can't perform it with good form, then you probably can't perform it. Um, and then, so we would cut them off. And so we would let them go. And some of our clients would perform with good form and they would stop on their own when they felt fatigued or we would get them those two warnings. Then they would go home, take some rest. It would be at least 48 hours of rest, but most often it was around five days. The 48 hours of rest ensured that there was no soreness when they were coming in for their second um, session. But the five days, um, less than five days, made sure that they weren't getting any muscular strength with their outside training. So they weren't gonna become extremely strong by the time they came in for their second session. So with that five days of rest, they would come in for their second session, perform the push-up in the opposite position that they did on day one. So say they did standard, then they would be doing modified. So we would do that same warm-up to get their muscles going again, and then they would perform their next set of push-ups. After both sessions, we collected all the data, and we took a look at the correlation and comparison between the standard push-up number and the modified push-up number that these women were able to complete. So we sent over our information to a math professor in our Kings State Departments, Caitlin Parmalee, and she did all of the graphs for us. She's right back there in the green mask. Um, she was super helpful. So she created these graphs and you can see the first graph, um, the number of modified push-ups is plotted on the X and the number of standard push-ups is plotted on the Y. Each dot, the black dots represent a participant. And they were placed accordingly, depending on how many modified push-ups versus how many standard push-ups they were able to complete. Then you see this blue line running up through our graph, which is known as the line of best fit, which allowed us to understand the correlation between how many modified and how many standard push-ups these women were performing. So the correlation that we got out of our data is that R squared up in the corner, which is 0.72. And in math, that's a pretty strong correlation. So we were able to follow through and create this new scale, knowing that we were able to make it with accuracy because that correlation was strong. So we created the new scale on this table. You can see in the middle column is the new predicted scale. It's rounded to the nearest push-up so that the numbers make a little bit more sense for us. And then in the last scale is the existing modified scale that came from the ACSM. You can see that they're compared right here, and the more push-ups you do for both scales, the better the rating you're going to get. But if we can create a new scale with accuracy, why do we need that original modified scale in the first place? We should just be using the standard scale if women are able to complete that standard push-up. So now I'm going to hand it off to Liz to talk a little bit more about the importance. All righty. Now, with all of that being said, I want to take some time to reflect on why it's so important to have a scale that doesn't change from person to person. 
As Sophie and Dr. Adams started to mention earlier, the fitness community has a large gender divide and we listed a ton of examples where you see it everywhere. So by creating this scale, it's a step in the right direction to stop putting a gender on exercise. We want people of all fitness levels to feel empowered to exercise and do what's best for their physical and mental health. And gender norms can often hold people back from making them feel as if they don't belong in a certain area. So with all that being said, push-ups are still a very challenging exercise for both men, women, transgender, non-binary people. It's a challenging exercise. And so we want to accommodate everybody, as I've said a million times already. So in order to do that, we want to take a step, take the push-up step test to the next step. Here we go. So with that, we have the step push-up. So instead of categorizing men and women's fitness abilities, we wanted to make a test that could accommodate everybody's fitness level. So with that, we came up with the stair push-up. So in these two pictures here, we have somebody, this is basically what the test would look like. We have somebody doing a push-up at different inclines of each step. So obviously the hardest or what would get you the best rating would be doing it from the ground or the floor and then one step up, Still a good rating, two step, three step, four step. But the reps would not change. So whether it's three reps, 10 reps, 20 reps, to be determined for sure. But everybody would do the same number of reps and this, the incline at which you would do the push ups would determine your rating. So we made this small little chart here in the corner. Now let's keep in mind, we have not recruited anybody to participate in this study. We've not, we have not looked into a certain number of reps here. This is just an example so you guys can get a visual of what we're trying to accomplish next. So now, while doing all of this research and realizing more and more of this strict divide in fitness, we wanted to get a better insight on how the women felt about this divide since we were working with women. And with that, we had athlete interviews. So we had the idea of running a qualitative study this time. And so here we have this chart. We recruited six female athletes who play sports here at Keene State. We had three freshmen. We had a swimmer, basketball player, softball player, a sophomore cheerleader, a junior track and field and cross country runner, and a senior volleyball player. The interviews were very casual. They were recorded onto a transcript and it didn't take much longer than 10 to 15 minutes. All of these athletes, had different backgrounds, came from different places, different sports. And um, the reason why we chose female athletes is because these women are forced to be in our facilities probably every day, whether it's lifting in the off season, playing basketball on the courts on the gym, um, training with coach Testo for agility and speed and plyometrics. They're forced to be here. So they would know firsthand if they've experienced any inequality just from being in these Keene State facilities. So we took, we had these interviews, we consolidated everything they gave us from the transcripts and we put it together on a little brain map. And here it is. So we took this brain map and we put it on a nice big poster and made it look super pretty. And we brought it to the Academic Excellence Conference, which is an annual event here on campus where we take student scholars who've been doing research all year round. And it's just an opportunity for these students to share and what they've done with participants. And it's with their mentors. So in this case, Dr. Adams, with us, um, other Keene State College faculty members, students, staff, whatever. Normally, if we were in the pandemic, our family could be there, but it's okay. Um, and so with that, we found that all of the women we interviewed had to advocate for themselves at our facility and constantly had to go the extra mile just to be considered equal to their male athletes. And so to elaborate on that, Sophie is going to walk us through a deeper look at each little wing of our brain map. So all of the yellow you see on our map here. All right. So like Liz was saying, it is no coincidence that each of these female interviewees experienced inequality in one way or another in our gym facilities. Our facilities are hypermasculine, and these interviewees um, learned how to cope with that feeling of inequality in many ways. And there was actually a lot of commonalities between what they were telling us as we were prompting them with questions. 
they all saw the recognizable segregation in our gym between that first and second floor. And we, as we were asking them questions, we also found some more prominent commonalities. And I'm gonna tell you some quotes and things from these women and the commonalities that we feel are most important. So one of the first commonalities was the feeling of anger. So you'll see that in our top bubble way up there, the last yellow bubble, the feeling of anger. So we asked each female athlete, how does it make you feel when men assume they are stronger than you? And we got a pretty blatant answer. They all felt pretty angry. I have a quote from a basketball player and she said, it makes me mad because they don't even know you. They just kind of say that based on you being female. I feel like a lot of people will make, it would make them mad to the point where they wanna improve themselves. And what this athlete says leads right into our next main commonality between what these women were saying wanting to prove men wrong. So these athletes all said that when they felt like they were being judged in the gym, they wanted to work harder and they wanted to prove these gender stereotypes wrong. A softball player said to us, okay, I'm gonna work harder so I can prove you wrong and do better. They wanna keep improving and doing better to prove society and these standards wrong. The next commonality I'm gonna point out is the feeling of judgment and insecurity. We had a cross country runner discuss how she completely avoided our Keene State facility because of that fear of judgment and feeling insecure when she was in our facility. She stated, I don't wanna be judged and I don't wanna look weak. So I usually go and hide at Planet Fitness. This athlete is buying a membership to another gym down the road because she doesn't feel comfortable in our facility here. Why are we making an athlete pay when she has a free facility at her hands just so that she can feel comfortable to get in the workout that she feels necessary to improve in her sport. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is being that these women felt like they were held to a lower standard than men, that they were expected to do more cardio and less resistance training, that they wouldn't be able to lift as much weight. We had a quote from a senior volleyball player and she stated just this. She said, we have an image in society that males are meant to be doing weight training and women are supposed to be doing cardiovascular training. And females cannot be strong. They cannot lift weights. They cannot go over a certain amount of weight when they're doing weight training. She felt, like she felt these limits on her as she was in our gym. And she knew that society was holding to her to a lower standard, but she was trying to go out of her way and push herself. But now that we have identified all of these problems and these insecurities and worries that these women were feeling in our facilities, we want to bring up a way that we think we might be able to fix this issue or sort of propose a question to all of you. So we want to know, what do you think? Now that we've presented all of these ideas to you, we want to hear what you think. This is a question that we've been struggling with recently. Is it more of a facility problem or a self-efficacy problem that is preventing people from feeling comfortable in our gym? I'll explain the facility problem a little bit, and then Liz will go on to explain self-efficacy. So our gym is clearly separated by two levels. You can see in all these pictures, the first two are in the upstairs, and that last one all the way on the other side is in our downstairs. So our upstairs has all of the cardio equipment, and then the small room in the downstairs has most of the resistance training equipment, like Dr. Adams was mentioning earlier. So that upstairs has that one awkward room, that's known as the women's section. It was for the women that feel uncomfortable in that downstairs area. And it had good intentions, but it is a bad idea. It creates more separation in the end because women are gonna go up there where they feel more comfortable, but they're really put at a disadvantage because there's not as much good equipment for them to use down there. So do we need to rearrange the equipment, intermingle cardio and resistance floors, and try to figure out a way to fix the levels? Or does it have to deal with more of a self-efficacy problem? And I'll pass that off to Liz to explain a little bit. So as Sophie was saying, on the other end of the spectrum, do we think it's just a self-efficacy and confidence issue? For those of you who don't know what self-efficacy is, it's defined right here on the slide, an individual's belief in their own capacity to execute behavior. So to sort of simple that down for you, you can say that it's the belief that you can be successful at any given task. And believe it or not, it's often rated as a scale. So for example, my self-efficacy to be able to ride a unicycle right now is probably out of one or a two out of 10. 
It's not happening, nor do I really want it to happen. But I'm 5'11". My self-efficacy for me to be able to shoot a layup right now is probably around a nine or a 10. I've dabbled on the court a little bit. So with that being said, what we've heard from the interviews and just women that we've spoken to with our participants, they've often said that they're too scared or too insecure to go into weight rooms whether it's because there's so many meatheads in there, whether the weights are just so heavy and you know people don't know how to use the equipment that's there. It's an intimidating environment. So this is where we pass it on to you. Do you guys think it's a women's issue and it has to do with their confidence or self-efficacy? Or do you think it's how our facility is laid out and the environment we create? Yeah, what's up? Um, I don't think there's one clear cut answer as you guys have kind of gone on to prove with your research. Um, and I think a potential answer could be rearranging the woman's workout room, that room with the hardwood floor, uh, maybe bringing some of the downstairs weight room equipment upstairs, getting a new floor, finding a new place to do it and balancing the two zones um, because you can't really force anybody to do anything. Like you can't say all the women have to lift, with, uh, lift weights downstairs that's kind of like hypocritical uh, with the research, um, but providing them a space where they can feel safe um, and not judged by meatheads downstairs might be um, beneficial to all parties. All right, I love it. What else? Yeah, create a little conversation. Yeah. What you got? I think you've also got a, I can't do that with your legs. Um, <laughs> I think you've also got a third piece, which is a cultural problem. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason women don't feel comfortable because they've been culturally trained not feel comfortable. I went to the weight room downstairs for about five years before the pandemic and felt incredibly self-conscious until I realized that as a 55-year-old woman down there, I was completely invisible and nobody actually saw me. <laughs> and that helped me gain the confidence that I needed. But um, when I was teaching health and wellness class, a lot of my students would report, female students who would report that they really wanted to lift weights, hated going to the weight room. And then there was that magical moment when they discovered the little room upstairs and suddenly they found a place that they could have a home. So I think a lot of women like having their own space, but yeah, it needs to be more equal. Well, I guess my riff off of that is it's the, the culture of the facility, right? And and how that has how that's come about over time, right? And how that is maybe was maybe a result of values and and cultural um, definitions, right? Or what we thought were stereotypes um, from the past, and how that's led to what we have now. And how, how do you how do you break that down and work to something that? that serves everyone. And I guess my question out of that is, have you come across other colleges or universities that were just, you know, the most ideal, the best, the best way out ahead of this? And have, have you know, have other schools really gone and shown something that is the it future? It is a big buzz in university fitness setting. Like a lot of campus newspapers have picked this up. So when I do little searches to see what's kind of buzzing about this, if we're not the only one who's saying this is a problem. And so there are schools that are saying, well, maybe we need to have women's only hour in the facility. And then there's the pushback of, you know, well, privilege of which hour and why? And you know how scheduling anything here is. So can you imagine when we pick like what two hours a day we're gonna be closed if we wanna, you know, we don't want to say the area is closed to anyone. They're gonna be segregated again by gender. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of research like of actually physically changing things to see if it, it matter. Um, there's been a little bit of talk about like, is that women's only ideal work? So it's not at our Planet Fitness here in Keene, but several Planet Fitnesses do have a women's area. Walled off, this is for them. And the research, when I, I go looking for it, um, you know, there's publication bias. So only statistically significant things get published. Well, I can't find a published paper that shows that that makes a difference, that having a women's only area came up with any sort of change. I don't know if I'm just not finding it or if it's actually, it's not working and it's not getting published and therefore I don't know about it. 
I think one of the challenges is you face social norms that if you know people are coming to college with 18 years or more of social norms that have kind of separated those two. I was trying to think back to physical education classes. I don't think did you learn field hockey separate? or did you get to go to football? No, I I mean I definitely had right. So I was out there separate. with the field hockey yeah, and I, I wanted to be thrown in football. football. But um you may wonder like is that still the case? Like those of you in high school, did you have male and female? Did you get separated? In the gym classes, or was everyone together? I was separated. I mean, within sports, like everybody played oh, basketball, sure sports, everybody played yeah. soccer. But when it came to that fitness test, it was still separated. Yep. You hang. What you just said. <laughs> they they separate for tests. Oh, for the test. Yep. Yeah. Um, which in some ways you feel like you must want to challenge that. You do see like some up and coming sports where oh, they're up and coming, but where there's not quite as much, but there still kind of is. I mean, I think about you know the kid who plays hockey, and there's a couple least you know, outwardly looking female <laughs> right. children that are on that they're, and, but there's talk about oh they play on the boys team and it's not the boys team it's a co-ed right. team, it's a co team. But, but then or, they separate them as soon as they start to play. right and as soon um, as there is an opportunity that there's actually enough females to play a whole team that young female on a on an all-males team will be shepherded to this other team whether they want it to be or not it's almost like we need to start at the preschool Mm -hmm. and and challenge you know we need to challenge that sooner so at 18 you don't come with that baggage it's interesting the sports that don't have that baggage wrestling it's, it's your weight so youth wrestlers and uh martial arts i'm looking at alec when i say martial arts the martial arts tend to go with what's your weight what's your skill level you will you will fight against whoever is of that equal level and so gender is not part of the equation that's, that's a hard sell. I, I've had, you know, I, I worked with one trans child. That was not something that interested them at all. You know, I'm like, see here, nobody cares about gender. And they're like, I don't want to get hit. <laughs> I'm not interested in that, right? So that's a hard sell. But, the, you know, it, it is interesting, you know, how early we divide children. We divide them way before puberty, before there's even a chance that there might be some sort of strength challenge. We go ahead and divide them because it's cultural. It is our expected norm that that's going to happen. You had your hand up for a sure. <laughs> okay. It's his class. We should let him talk. Um, on the, the question about the upstairs, downstairs, uh, male, female, gym, uh, Keene State, I, I know that they're called that, and I, I get you know, uh, why they're understood that way. But there are differences, other differences between just the amount of weight. I mean, the, the upstairs gym in outside the picture there, there's stretching mats, there's bands, there's there's a number of things that I would actually not want to see in a crowded weight room like downstairs. I would feel unsafe if I was using the mats and people are you know dealing with heavy weights and things like that. Uh, likewise, um, I've always looked, you know, that rack of big heavy weights up there. I've always wondered who would pick up the hundred pound barbell in that room, you know, I just, I'm not sure it would feel, I wouldn't get safe dealing with it. Right, and, and you're gonna dent that floor. Right, I'd rather have it down on the- There's no floor. doubt, you're gonna- um, So I'm thinking that, you know, they're, they're different rooms, but they're different uses put to them. And the, the open space in the wood, people I, I know do stretches that move them across the floor and back and forth. And that, that's a space that's there for them. And I would not do that downstairs, so. Yeah, I think, so uh, two things happened. I wasn't here when they built this, this addition to our gym, right? Um, it was a square footage issue. They were blocked, blocked up to that parking lot and they only could go so far. So we can only go so far this way, so let's go up. And then that limited square footage on both levels. What can we do? And so immediately they, they thought safety and there, there are guidelines for how far equipment has to be from each other and one of the safety thoughts is don't intermingle equipment because you've got people moving in different ways mm -hmm. and that could be a hazard. So if we were to intermingle things, the best floor plan for that is more of the planet fitness look where it's all one level. And it's a little bit of cardio near some weight stuff. It's a weight rack near some cardio, some stretching area. It's not the, because we're, we're limited square footage wise, 
then it becomes a traffic issue, right? So there's, yeah, it, it's complicated. If you have your hand in the back, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna try and like go a little bit off of what he had. I think it's like mainly a cultural thing. Uh, I personally actually transferred here from a different school. And obviously I have the male lens, but <coughs> when I came here, I was like, this is great. Like there's a whole floor where if I want to do cardio, cardio is over here. I don't have to be like around the weights. If I want to do weights, I can do this. I'm a guy who like loves to stretch, warm up, cool down. And kind of as you were saying, like, I don't want to like be on the floor, like doing everything I want to do for 15 minutes, like right next to a squat rack as somebody's like squatting. So I was like, I can go upstairs. I had never heard that term because I'm new here as well. And so maybe that would have kept me out of it. Like, I don't know, but I like, I kind of like the separate, um, I thought this. I thought the rooms themselves are separate in a good way. It's just the culture of labeling them incorrectly. But like the actual setup, I'm a pretty big fan of. And compared to my last school, like movement pattern is like way better. Okay, I like that. There, there's some interesting other terminology that get, gets labeled. Um, so it, I spent a, a decent amount of time in that lower level weight room when female athletes are doing their team workouts. And I correct them all the time. The shorter bar that weighs 35 pounds is not the girl bar. It is a training bar. It is a 35 pound bar. Pieces of equipment do not have genders. And they look at me like, yes, you're the weird academic person. It's the girl bar because only girls use it. And I'm like, it's not the girl bar. It's the appropriate bar for the fitness level you're at now. Just like when I take you know, detrained male clients, this is the appropriate bar for the fitness level you are now. Right? And, and so changing that culture of how we name things and what we allow is part of the problem. Yeah, coming in with the expectation of what is boy, what is girl is underlying all of what we're seeing. Yes. I just want to share a couple comments from the chat. Um, maybe one former student sending their best to HPMS faculty, Jason Kitchens. Oh, I recognize hi, that Jason. name. But he's there. And then Lisa Daly um, said, I'm in Connecticut, and although we purposely don't separate students while testing, we still report scores by gender. We can mark down the score by how someone identifies, but if non-binary, we pick their biological sex, whether they choose that or not. Wow. Thanks for sharing so that, Lisa. Hi, and I'm actually an alumni too. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> yes. Um, so I really, um, our district is really big on equity. And um, this is something that I actually have been spending a lot of time on. And this is a great topic for us. Um, fit testing, though, to your point, the culture just doesn't start in high school. The culture of boys and girls, and you should be working with this equipment or playing this sport is elementary. Right. Until we start stop genderizing everything that we're doing in elementary school, it's going to perpetuate itself through the higher grades. So I love that you're doing this work and thank you um, for allowing other people to join you. This is wonderful. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Yeah. Would, um, would a psychological standpoint kind of help ease the kind of reset the culture ideals that people walk in with? Or um, if there were a group of men working out on the bottom floor and there was a female there and she felt uncomfortable, there was someone she could go to because there are a lot of student workers there. Um, could there be punishments for mistreating people in the gym? Um, are there like, I don't know, reward incentives? Like I, I had a very basic psychology understanding. So like I know that there's much more that goes into it, but could ideals like that help to kind of deconstruct culture rather than trying to create a new one over a poor foundation. You know, you don't want to build a structure on a poor foundation. So if you just reset that and then start from there, you can build something great. Would that be the angle that you go towards? It's an interesting thing because anytime we're doling out punishment, we're also doling out shame. And shame creates anger. Right. So now we have to be really careful about if I shame you for misbehaving in the weight room, are you going to retaliate at some other point when somebody isn't there to see it? Or what is the message? I, I, I want everybody to be physically active. That's, you know, that's the central goal I have is that everybody be physically active. And you know, sort of a, a key central idea is don't punish you through the exercise. Like I don't want you to feel punished when you're here. 
So how do we reward people who have good behavior? I mean, we set a standard. There's a dress code standard and you can get wonky about the, the gendering of the dress codes, but there's a standard for that. There's a standard for language. It is amazing when a woman with white hair walks through the middle of that weight room, the language changes really dramatically. Like I've never heard those words before or something, but it just, oh, you gotta behave. If we had that behave attitude sort of all the time, it might be a little bit different. Someone's trying to get Somebody in. wants in, I'll do that. I did like your idea. Sorry, I wasn't letting me in, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I really liked your idea of having somebody to go to in the gym when you feel uncomfortable. And maybe that's something we can work on talking with the body work staff, mm -hmm. making sure that if you do feel uncomfortable, male or female, that you have somebody to talk to and they can help you transgress what's making you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, that's a good idea. Eight letters are here. The math people want to talk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I can say the, the biggest barrier for me in the weight room is when I moved to Keene, I went to the, uh, the YMCA. Um, was I didn't know how to use the equipment because I, yeah, I mean, it, growing up, obviously because of the culture, I was never trained on that equipment. I knew I had some from doing track and field in college, but I just didn't know. But the YMCA offered, you could get this like 30 minute session that was like an intro to all the stuff. So the guys, you know, he walked me through like, what are, what are your goals? Mm -hmm. I want to do this, this, and this. Like, my shoulder sucks. How do I fix that? Um, and so he showed me which machine machines I wanted to use, how to use them safely. And then I just had a circuit that I did every time. I felt way more comfortable going to the gym after that, after I had the training. I didn't know if Keen State does that. If you can get like a, a person to kind of walk you through and show you how to use stuff safely. Yeah. I like, are we doing that? Are we doing individual? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't, I don't yeah. want to comment on that. So I don't believe there's anything, like there's not one thing you can sign up for and yeah. go and travel through everything, but the body work staff is always happy to help out with that. If you have questions about how to use any piece of equipment, come up to any of the body work yeah. staff. We can do our best, take you up to it, show you how to use it, give you a little uh, equipment orientation, we call it. Yeah. I feel like often the bodywork stuff isn't utilized in that way because yeah. a lot of I feel yeah. like a lot of kids don't know that they can use it. Yeah, yeah, just maybe that's something we'll get out there a little bit more. Yeah. And I did have this idea, like you had said, that like session sort of like yeah. just intro. an overall intro. When we were presenting at the AEC, that idea did come up, and we thought maybe creating a little one-time or two-time class when people first come to the KSC gym to sort of do an <coughs> overview of our gym and how to use equipment might be a good idea. Yeah. Um, are there monitors in the gym? Because like like TV screens or something? I feel like I've seen one. There are upstairs in the cardio session. Yeah, um, it might be good to put things on there because when people are working out, they're going to look around and see something and be like, oh, I'm going to read that right now. Mm -hmm. I know I've done it. I run on the treadmills a lot. So mm -hmm. um, maybe putting messages, encouraging fair like not the fair, fair play earlier, but like the current, like yeah. be safe in the gym, respect everyone equally, don't yeah. make anyone uncomfortable, um, use the body work staff appropriately. Here's what we can do. Like yeah. sending those messages to the TV um, could subliminally help your cause. Yeah, I tried it, like I'm, so, but I'm struggling with maybe all of you thought about this more is there's a real, um, I mean, there's a hormonal difference to strength. Right. So, um, and those with higher testosterone levels tend to be able to get, you know, are just naturally stronger. Right. Um, and thinking about how do we balance that where we have such a competitive society. Um, and I guess, you know, personally, I, I work out in any one of those locations, don't really worry, but I realize that's, I'm hearing that that's not the case, but how do we balance that so that people who don't have as high of testosterone levels? can be in a space like that and not feel intimidated by those that are so much you know, bigger. physically stronger, or just right. bigger. The, the accepting of your individual difference is, is a hard thing to teach an 18 year old, right? So I, I, I'll come at your question from like another side. So when I was working as an athletic trainer, um, I had a soccer athlete and she was female. She put on muscle like that. Well, come to find out her brother was an NFL football player. She had a genetic gift, right? She had this wonderful, amazing genetic gift. And culturally, 
socially, she felt like weird, like, oh, I don't like this. Make this go away. I don't want to train. I don't want to play soccer. And I had to have a real big heart to heart. Like, this is who you are. Like, this is an amazing gift you have. Like, this, this is incredible. You, you should love this. And I tried to explain you're burning more calories. You're going to live longer. Your bones are strong. I, all my list of great things. And she, at 20 years old, just said, nobody finds me attractive. Nobody, meaning people of the opposite sex, don't find me attractive. And, I'm, you know, so we, we battle with what is appropriate and then am I achieving that appropriate? So learning to love exercise for the sake of exercise and not what it makes you look like is, is something that takes more time than I think a college student's going to acquire in these four years. There's a maturity that will happen eventually, I hope. So yeah, this has been a really good conversation and I'm noticing that it is getting pretty close to seven o'clock, which is when we were hoping to end. And there's one last little thing that we want to show you all before, and the video is not there. Is it not there? How do I see it? I I'm gonna be sad if our video doesn't play. Yeah. Uh-oh. It's a really cute video that we wanted to show you all. Uh-oh. How did it not turn through? There's, not, there's always there's always one more body to but since y'all have a hard time seeing that title it says if you see it you can be it and <laughs> the video will show you a little bit about if you're exposed to weight training and strength training as a young child that you might be more likely to go ahead and have that self-efficacy have that motivation to do it as you get older and once they figure out the video you'll be able to watch it it's really cute. It's worth the wait and all the technical, <laughs> technical difficulties. So, yeah. while we're waiting, yeah. Yeah, while we're waiting. Uh, I want to go back to the push up training okay. and, the, and the unified push up. Okay. Oh. I'll ask you some other yeah, questions. Yeah, okay. Sure. Sure. We're getting a spinning. That's good. Just need to share a screen again. Share, share screen. screen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Looking good remotely here. This is from the Olympics. Yeah. Powerlifting you know, athletes. This is the checkers game where grandson. They might be more likely to advocate for themselves as they get older and want to participate in those activities. And that is a strong example of showing your daughter, a woman who is weightlifting, showing your child an example of someone who is doing the exercise you may want them to participate in the future. Well, thank you guys so much.